everyone thank you for coming attending this meeting today tomomi will be presenting on her impressive shake table test uh, in taiwan and she will be explaining how she is trying to model all the stuff related to that uh, she is a phd student with uh, ken uh, at university of auckland so tomomi please thank you for presenting and Thanks, Robin. Uh, so um, today I'm going to talk about uh, OpenSeed, uh, mainly about OpenSeed analysis for uh, shake table test conducted in in Kui, Taiwan as a collaboration between New Zealand and Taiwan. Okay, uh, so I just uh, listed the contents of uh, today's talk. So first, I'm gonna talk about overview of my experimental work. And then um, I'm gonna talk about uh, my OpenSeeds model uh, to simulate the response that we observed during shake table test. So um, I'm going to talk about the modeling and the amount, some analysis results from response history analysis and push over analysis, which I did for second assessment. And I also going to talk about general things about OpenSeed. So I actually started using OpenSeed and Pickle, and then I combined that script uh, to OpenSeed PY. And then, um, so I, I can show the example script um, from Pickle and Python, then you can see some difference between them. And I can also show the simple to degree of freedom model. So it's always good to start from simple model uh, when you run analysis. So I can show the script for the simple model that, uh, so that you can um, see the, um, how um, I organized the script to create the model. And uh, in the end, I can also talk about some issues I experienced. Uh, some of them I already solved, but some are not. So uh, we can uh, hopefully uh, we can discuss these issues after my presentation. Okay, also uh, the research objectives. Um, so in our shake table test project, we aim to investigate in elastic torsional response of existing reinforced concrete structures, especially focusing on Taiwan, uh, the, those buildings in Taiwan and New Zealand because um, those buildings have usually have structural weaknesses, such as soft and uh, soft weak uh, stories, and uh, some buildings have a uh, non-ductile element. So uh, that's a good opportunity to uh, investigate uh, this kind of things uh, together. So we're particularly focusing on displacement demand due to an elastic torsional response. Uh, that's, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, oh, thanks. <laughs> so lateral load is applied at center of mass usually, but when we have the uh, center of resistance or um, stiffness um, shifted from center of mass because of nonlinear behavior and the resulting damage, we could expect um, high stress demand in the damaged side, but uh, we actually don't know uh, if this can cause torsional response in reality. And if it does, and then how much stress demand we will see in real building. 
So you need to investigate that just demand due to questionnaire response. So we conducted check your test for two specimens, both are seven story and half scale. And um, both specimens had a soft and weak fast story. We designed three radial systems using the two specimens. So, um, so for first specimen, we tested a uh, stiffness irregular system as series 1A, and then a uh, damage irregular system as series 1B. And we used specimen 2 to test uh, ductility irregular system as series 2. And in this project, um, both specimens were subjected to unidirectional earthquake excitation to um, to remove the effect of the bidirectional input to torsional response. Okay, uh, so this is, is about input ground motion and input sequence. So I, I used uh, the ground motion shown in this figure. Uh, this is the what we call 100% input. This is originally from PEL database. Uh, the original record is from uh, East West component or at station CHI 101 from TG earthquake. And then uh, we time scale that ground motion by one of our square root two because the specimens were half scale. And also, the ground motion, original ground motion was amplified by 2.65 to adjust the conditional mean spectrum. So this table shows the input sequence. So each test series, we did four earthquake input. Uh, we started from small earthquake input, like 10 and 20%. And in series 1A, we input two 60% input after small input. Then, um, after this input, we removed the masonry if it will be installed during series 1A and then started from small input and then followed by 40 and 60 percent input. For specimen 2, uh, we did the same input sequence we did for series 1B. Okay, also the these are the photos from series 1A uh, in which we tested stiffness irregularity system. As you can see, uh, the frame in the west has masonry wall at the first story, so it's very stiff. In contrast, uh, we don't have any wall uh, in east. So we expect uh, expected high drift demand in the fridge for this frame. So what we saw in during this test uh, was like this. So I'm plotting the peaks past story drift in the east and west. So red lines, a red line is for east frame and the blue line is for west frame. So we we saw clear difference in drift demand in east and west during this test series. And after the 60% input, um, we saw uh, concrete spalling in east frame, where some, only some fractional cracks and the clumps at the west. The interesting thing uh, we saw in this series was the drift demand increase in second 60% input. So we we did same uh, earthquake input, but got different um, drift demand. Okay, so in series 1A, we got different damage status of the first story clumps. So we removed 
the masonry wall in the west and uh, tested the specimen again in series 1b. Okay, again, we, uh, we are seeing the peak fastly drift uh, in this test tree. So, sorry, in that, this test tree showed the uh, torsional response from small input to up until the end of the test tree. And sorry, in the 60% input uh, pictures was like 14%. So uh, it didn't sit on the catch ring, but uh, we, um, we said it's collapse of the basement. So you can see the difference of damage at the end of the test. So more falling and um, crashing of the concrete. But for West side, it is only so pressure cracks and some minor falling. Okay, uh, so this is for C2, ductile B irregular system. So this is the test for specimen two. And uh, the frames in the West and East look, look like um same but um these are the photos from uh, before concrete casting as we can see the clumps in the west are very ductile so the transverse reinforcement uh, was uh p10 with uh 15 millimeter facing and we also added cross ties so very ductile um compared to that um, the clumps in the east was uh, very non-ductile. So we made this with um, T6 bars with 250 millimeter facing and these hooks are with uh, 90 degree hooks. So we expected uh, earlier strength degradation in non-ductile clumps and then resulting torsional response. Okay, uh, so these, this is the test result from 3.2. We saw the symmetric response in um, three input, 10 and 20 and 40 percent input. And then um, we saw the some brittle failure mode in 60% input, and then as showed torsional response. So the specimen actually collapsed during 60% input. So the peak response we, we can see here is the drift amount of actual failure of one of the first one. So I can show the video from the 60% of input of this test tree. I'm also showing the first story draft and the east and the west in the right side. And I can also show the base and other story draft relationship. Um, as you can see, um, so we got more draft in this side, but this frame stays at like zero draft here. So we saw torsional response in this this tree. Okay, uh, this is, is a summary from this result of uh, circular test. So in seed 1A, uh, we saw torsional response in all aspect input, and the peak drift occurred at 
the pulse of the ground motion. And uh, we also uh, saw the high drift demand, higher drift demand in second 60% input. And C1B, uh, where we tested damage irregular system, we also saw um, capture torsional response in all earthquake input. And uh, the response actually remained torsional until the end of this series. And in C2, um, the response was symmetric until 40% input, and we saw torsional response in 60% input. And the torsional response increased uh, during the subsequent cycles um, after the pulse of the ground motion. That, but uh, interesting thing we want to investigate more using numerical model. Okay, um, I want to move on to the compensate analysis. So I'm going to talk about modeling of the for the check table specimens and uh, some analysis result from response history analysis and uh, visual analysis. Okay, I, I listed some purposes of doing open seas analysis. Uh, first of all, uh, it's important if you are doing experimental tests, I, I think it's important to do analysis to estimate the response or behavior. And but that's what I've done before shake table test. And uh, after the test, um, I, I need, needed to validate the numerical model uh, to see the similar response uh, in numerical analysis. And once we validate the numerical model, we can use that model for seismic assessment or parametric analysis. So this is how my 3D model looks like. Um, so I'm showing the, the specimen here in the left. And uh, I, I just um, use the OpenSea PY code to plot this model. So uh, I'm going to show a little bit detail of 3D model. So the node at base was fixed because we didn't see any uh, a significant displacement reactive to shake the wall at home. So uh, we, we saw it's good to fix, just fix the base for this analysis model. And the, for this specimen, the most important thing to is to model the fast solid clumps properly because it, it was a uh, soft, fast story. So I created the fast story clumps with four space beam column element with tiger section and connected to zero length element to represent the slip behavior at the end of the clump. For the other elements like um, concrete slabs, I use trust element, elastic trust element to make the diaphragm widget and uh, for the beams, um, I used force based beam column element for the fast story beams, but I used elastic beam column element for the rest of the beams. For the RC walls, I, I used layered shell element because I, I studied um, I, in my TICO script, I, I used layered shell element, so I, I didn't change anything from that. For the masonry wall in this uh, series 1A, I use, also use truss element, but it's, uh, it has some nonlinear um, performance. Yeah, uh, about the mass, uh, uh, 
because um, I simulated personal response of this business, it was uh, it really important to check the distribution of the mass. I think we usually, uh, if we have six nodes of each floor, we can distribute the mass like this. But um, if we check the mass moment of inertia of this specimen, but this, the distribution in real specimen is like this. So, sorry, I redistributed the nodal mass to have same mass moment of inertia. So I used the mass distribution for gravity load analysis here, but for to to run uh, earthquake analysis, I, I used uh, I assigned nodal mass uh, as shown in the right slide. Okay, uh, for response history analysis, uh, I, I did uniform uh, excitation and ground motion I used was um, the recorded ground acceleration from checkable test. And I did sequential analysis uh, we did in the test. So 10, 20, 60% twice, and then we moved the elements for only interval and then started from small input to large input. Um, so for specimen two, I haven't completed the um, analysis, so I, I cannot show the results for that. Yeah, uh, I'm going to compare the experimental results and analysis results uh, for fast wave drift. So I'm going to show the results from uh, stiffness irregularity system at fast 60 percent input. So the, the plot at the top show the fast wave drift demand uh, in the east plane, which was flexible and black line as from experiment and red line show the analysis result. So uh, I'm showing the best one <laughs> from my analysis. Uh, it did capture la large drift demand and uh, the peel seemed right. So this model was very good. And uh, also, the dress demand in the middle and west really fit uh, close to the experimental result. And uh, I run the second 60,000 input, and uh, um, it captured the dress demand increase in the second 60,000 in analysis. Uh, so, uh, the peak seems a little bit off from experimental result, but uh, that's, I think, um, still good model, I think. But um, after running four input in stage 1A, um, I did four earthquake input for stage 1B, and I'm going to show the Results from 40 percent input for season B. So um, you can see the um, residual drift from season A uh, was totally bit off from experimental result, and uh, um, you can see the difference between experimental and analysis result in this model. So this model was good for series 1A, but um, I think we, uh, I need to think about to improve the model to capture the response in series 1B. So this is a 60 percent input in series 1B. So peaks seems close to the experimental result, but it the model cannot capture the collapse of the specimen. 
from that as another problem with my analysis model. Yeah, I also did nonlinear static analysis for assessment purpose. Then I, I used lump plus K model uh, to do static analysis because we, we cannot uh, do sequential analysis uh, in static analysis. So the lump so I replaced the force based element, force based beam form element to its elastic beam form element. And I assigned uh, the effective, um, effective stiffness factor for this elastic element. And then I assigned nonlinear property and for the sterling's sexual spring. So this black line shows the uh, performance curve for tactile clamp. And for series 1D, I, I used this curve to represent the damage with the uh, east, clamps in the east. And for the non tactile element, um, I included the negative slope, as you can see here, and the deformation capacity of these springs are based on uh, AC41 modeling parameter. Yeah, oh, I, I will show the, um, some pressure buffer from the analysis. So this one in the left, show the base shear and displacement at roof relationship from tissue analysis. And I also show the fast story and the fast story displacement relationship um, for each uh, west, middle, and east range. And this is from phase 1D. Um, I also compared this with uh, the envelope from experiment. So uh, in the right, I'm showing the experimental result and I just plotted that line here. So at least um, by, by looking at this figure, I, I was confident that um, the, even the lumped plus this D model, I can um, create a Good model. And for uh, C2, uh, because the model from SC41 is a bit conservative, so the deformation capacity of the analysis model uh, looks a bit, um, a bit uh, small compared to um, what we actually captured from experiment. So these are the results by using lump plus DST model. And I also compare these with um, the analysis result with uh, fiber sections. So the figure in the left side show the uh, analysis result from fiber sections and the right side is the from lump plus this model. What we saw from this figure is um, um, we saw um, more P delta effect in lump plus this model because in force based beam from element um, the steel material properties of Steel. Uh, because of the material property of the steel, uh, we, we can get more post yield stiffness. So we can see a big increase in stiffness after yielding. But um, in lump plasticity model, uh, we can see some negative slope. So even 
just replacing the uh, performance um, the model with from fiber element to lump plastic model. It can uh, make the difference in analysis model uh, analysis uh, race multi analysis. So I also compare the race multi history analysis. Uh, so this is from uh, fiber model that, that I showed in previous slide. And this is from uh, lump plastic model. So in, I, I made the element softer to represent the damage of the element. So I've got more response. In, in terms of the assessment, I think it's good because as we, we get more drift demand, so it can give the conservative estimate. But in terms of estimating the drift demand in experiment, that's not that good model. Okay, um, so I'm gonna show a little bit about um, Combining the open state tackle to open state DY. Okay, um, showing the script for creating nodes for shakeable specimens. This is tickle and this is Python. So both scripts are doing the same thing, creating the nodes for uh, seven story specimen. But um, for me, Python script uh, um, better organized and it's good to set the variable and also um, what else? Um, yeah, so for me, uh, combining the script from Tico to Python was good, uh, but um, um, but uh, if you're using the OpenSea's Tickle right now and thinking about combining the Tickle to Python and you have already have complex model, it's not that easy to combat um, the script immediately. So I started from, so actually started to use OpenSeed DY by creating a simple two degree of freedom model. So this is just showing the two degree of freedom model I, I did for other projects. And so this is a script for that model. So um, in open CTY uh, we just uh, we first need to import the thing and then create a node and then set up the mass and constraint and set up materials and create elements. So after creating this model, so I I got better picture of um, making Python script for my shakeable specimen. So then um, after, after getting good results from this model, I started combining the tickle for my shakeable test. Okay, um, yeah, so I just listed the issues I faced um, First thing, a general thing, um, it was really difficult to install the, soft, the software to run Python script and to universal open computer. So I actually formatted the computer once and then installed the software. So if you have installed Python related software uh, previously, uh, it can cause like issues and computers. So we, we need to get help from IT. 
And um, for Anna, if you're you you're gonna use or you're using Anaconda three, um, I installed the Anaconda under my user profile, and after that, every time I restart the computer, it takes like a few hours to start up my profile. So. Uh, I'm still experiencing this issue, so someone knows how to solve it. So I, I, I won't do it here on solution. It looks like it's specific. Um, the first one I installed in other few computers at the university. In my computer, I didn't have because I didn't install anything. Oh. But Anaconda 3 profile thing is like. Uh, I don't know what's I never happening, but, but okay. it's still. Solving the problem in okay. the computer, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for computation things, um, uh, if I run like three analysis at the same time, uh, I use like uh, for almost 100 possible memory. And uh, in Tickle script, uh, when I was using Tickle, I could use Nessie as uh, it provides us to use uh, it, it. We can use the supercomputer of um, the Nessie. So I, we can submit the job and run the analysis and the computer outside of the office and then can get the result. But the, the thing computer in this doesn't have open PY, so I can't actually run my office PY model using supercomputer. And uh, oh yeah, um, so check the parts in the script. Uh, so if you're reading the some files in Python script and uh, that show, if it shows the wrong directory, um, usually Camel dies. So I think if you see that some um, Camel died thing, and then first thing you need to check as the pass in the so pass for the reading file and. Uh, the other thing is uh, create log files. Uh, it's, I think it's important to create log files for each analysis to track the change in your analysis model and parameters. So for the analysis things, um, equal DOF. For equal DOF, so I, I listed this because the error in equal DOF um, caused Camel dies again. And so first thing I, I check when Camel dies, I check the parts in the script and the equal DOF. So if you experience the same thing, I think it's good to check these things first. Just to add one point, uh, Kernel dies in multiple other occasions as well. When you have two nodes with two different node numbers, and the length is like uh, very small. It again, for some reason, the analysis stops and kernel dies. And there are in my few other occasions which it happens. So, yeah. So, so when kernel dies, it it doesn't show any error message. So okay. we need to figure out um, what is wrong. Sometimes use multiple times. It just runs. Kernel dies, 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 and suddenly it shows error. So, it's like, <laughs> so it happened to me multiple times. And like, oh, okay, this is the error. Go back and check it. Okay. Um. So, some other issues with um 3D modeling. Um. So 3D modeling uh, model are uh, usually complex and more script and memory usage compared to 2D models. And I also need to 
consider the bidirectional performance of the plant. So if you don't have to do three, create 3D model for your uh, test or whatever, I, I recommend to do 2D analysis for 2D model. And uh, yeah, com convergence issues, um, I, I think common and opposite analysis. Um, I experienced convergence issues a lot because of the negative slope in concrete materials or negative slope for strength degradation model. And uh, if you use, you use some specific material models like reinforced reinforced reinforcing scale, yeah, reinforcing scale, sorry. Yeah. Reinforcing scale and uh, modified MK model, especially for 3D models, can cause convergence issues. And um, well, for bumping, also uh, my analysis was really sensitive to the uh, setting, uh, setting of really dumping. So if I change the mode to take constant values, um, I can change the analysis result significantly. So we need to be careful with the dumping. And uh, as you know, same model is not always good for all test results for multiple purposes. So some models are good to um, show elastic response, like response in 10 and 20 percent input. But uh, when I run 60 percent input, um, I usually got a bad result in previous. When model. you say when you say it's not always good in terms of what it's not good. So if we look at the uh, analysis result for 10 and 20 percent input. Mm -hmm. They show the right drift demand compared to experimental results, but if they run um, 60 percent input for the same model, it don't always show the good results. So, okay. um, so in that case, the modeling for nonlinear performance of the element was not right. And yeah, so we need so okay. we need to check both elastic and inelastic response, and also for lumpy plasticity model, we usually soften the spectral springs um, compared to actual initial stiffness to for for better estimate for nonlinear response. So. If we run 10% input using lump plasticity model, um, it's really soft compared to um, initial state of the specimen. So it can cause larger much larger drift demand. So uh, even if you use the same model, uh, it won't, it may not. Um, show the good result for all the cases. And also, um, I did push up analysis for assessment purposes. So, if we see, conserv if we see conservative uh, estimate, that's good because that's assessment. But if we use the same model for to simulate the observed response, if it's too conservative, it's not good. So we need to um, make sure why we are doing the analysis using that model. So if, if the, we are using that model for different purposes, we need to we may need to change the model. And okay, uh, the last thing is something that I I. So when I compare the analysis results with experimental results, um, I from shake table test I couldn't get the course on the first week one. So I I want to check the performance. I, 
I wanted to check the performance of the first story font, but I can only do so by checking the displacement, so not the voice. So, um, um, so uh, oh, if um, I'm gonna do the component test here in Oakland, so um, unless you get the right result for voice or element, I, I cannot compare that. So I need to be careful to then comparing the experimental results and analysis results. Okay, uh, so I always acknowledge that three things are first uh, increased paid for the specimen, so let's speak and uh, people from increase supported the entire shape table test. So, and uh, as well as funded by Quick Core and uh, the one. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Tamomi. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, we'll open for the questions. So, guys, go ahead. I have, I have a couple questions, or you might have to go back and forth. So. Anyone? Any questions? I have a couple questions. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can. Um, so that was that was a really good presentation. Thank you so much. Um, very very interesting. Like Pavan said, um, I guess my questions are around uh, with regards to the failure modes in your columns in the test. Were the failure modes primarily flexural compression, or did you see any torsion uh, shear failure in your columns? Exactly. For for columns, not. Out. So for the fossil clams, um, we got bidirectional demand on clams, but it's not local twist in the clam. So that's that's like pushing and um, like 45 degrees. Uh, so that's crossing at the corner of the clam. So that's not the twist. Of the I see. So clam. you didn't, there was no like diagonal cracking in your columns? No, for flexural clams, no. So for the non vector clams, we saw diagonal flux, but it was because of the shear. So, okay, cool. So that brings me to my next question then. How did you model shear and torsion in your columns? Uh, for, in, I, I said the, um, Stiffness of the um, um, so I, I said in post plate beam column element, I, I can we can say the uh, stiffness of the torsion. Uh, no, no, uh, uh, we can add the stiffness of the aggregator. No, they can just in post based beam clone element, I, we can add the thickness of the torsion of uh, to, uh, twisting. So, so you took uh, basically you took the shear and torsional uh, behavior to be linear, right? Yes, yes. So, okay. in those non ductile columns, it sounds like you might have gotten a non linear shear and or torsion failure. And I'm wondering if that's why you weren't able to capture. B, I think it was B1 or something. I read. Uh, so 1B, or we, uh, uh, it, it's for ductile plants. Ah, okay. So um, uh, they can capture the damage of the uh, plant for flexural damage properly. Um, I may be able to capture the response, but uh, I, I don't think it's because of not capturing the shear behavior of the columns. So which which test series was with the non-ductile columns? So the C is two. So it's 
for this one. So. Oh this. yeah! Wow, look at that. Yeah. Um, so where? So can can we look at your modeling results compared to the results, the experimental results for this? Um, so I only right now I only have the result for visual analysis. I see. Okay. Yeah, so with, by using the plasticity model. I see. So it, my initial take is uh, using nonlinear, uh, or sorry, using linear torsion and shear in this one won't necessarily work because your model can't capture the failure mode that you observed, mm -hmm. but that's just something to consider. Yes. I'm still figuring out how to model the Cool. <laughs> cool, cool. No, that's great. Awesome. Awesome. That was, those are my questions. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, then I can ask some. Hi, I Thank oh, you. Hi. I have a uh, question. Um, uh, my question is about your model. Um, when, why did you uh, distrib redistribute the mass for oh. the analysis? For gravity and so, because my model needs to capture the torsion, and uh, I don't distribute the mass properly, uh, it can cause more demand or less demand um, because, because of the dis just the distribution. Um, as you can see, we put the concrete mass here. Um, mm -hmm. It has like extra 400 millimeters thick concrete block. So we have some huge mass here, but if we distribute that portion to the end, then it can give more mass moment of inertia for this part. So, if, so actual distribution of based on actual distribution of the mass, um, if we take the um, cross the real uh, mass moment of inertia. Uh, How did you calculate the real mass moment of inertia? I did this and that's not a good way, but I did this in Excel sheet. So I copied the Excel sheet here and I um, I made a like, 25 mini grid for this whole plan and uh, I assigned the depth of, for that area mm -hmm. and calculated um, weight of the concrete and then Okay. I can I can multiply the distance from center okay. mass and then. Okay. So you say because mainly because of the torsion. Yes, yes. I, as as symmetric as I, I don't think that can cause the issue. Okay. Thanks. Actually, you, you updated mass for gravity and earthquake. Why did you do that? You can just apply like a force, right? In gravity yeah, analysis. Yeah, so, so I, I calculate the actual force on the clumps based on this distribution. And you didn't apply, okay. Because if I use this this for actual loading, so okay. this distribution for actual loading, I can um, put more okay. actual load. In the middle, so. so I thought like you updated actually the mass did you update the mass like for gravity and then re-updated the stuff or did you apply the mass for gravity analysis? So the normal mass is the what we see in the right that I apply the load. Okay, cool. Based on this. Okay, cool. Can you open the chat? Max, you can Yes. Oh, so I just threw it in the chat. Uh, so this slide reminded me of another question. I, um, I, I didn't use rigid 
reply from because I, I heard um, that can cause like convergence issues, so I didn't, I didn't, just didn't use. I had that because I had that. The most important thing: life was pressure, and not this person this. Also, so if they use displacement based. Uh, income element. Uh, we need to create more nodes. So that's. So I I already had uh, pickle script and converted it to Python, and uh, I, I I was using phosphate income element. So I it's it was like extra work to like the loop okay. for. So I because but I have that model this this placement base, but I haven't run. It. I just. Yeah. And what all things were you matching when you are saying like experimental and uh, your model results, right? So I saw like you are matching the displacement time history, mm -hmm. and are you matching periods, and are you also matching the FFTs and all that stuff? First of your transforms from the yeah, so experiment That period from eigenvalue analysis. Mm -hmm. um, for fiber model doesn't fit because it can give cheaper um, initial thickness. But when I compare the period after running earthquake analysis, I did a pretty big experimental result. And um, so in in some okay, thanks. <laughs> and so in terms of the period, um, um, for the period after earthquake, I'm not really confident, but for initial state. Okay. No. no, I was just curious. What are the constraints you have kept to make sure, like? Okay, it's not only the displacement time history, right? The displacement time history can match, but other things need not match. So, like, what are the multiple constraints you kept on your model to make sure that it is correct? Uh, so, uh, um, this is one thing. So, First thing I look at a quick response okay. and then check the time um, response history. Okay. And the, by looking at the um, face of the response, I think it's right. And then I do. Period also looks right. Um, and then I do. So I did eigenvalue analysis. Okay. So after say one day. Okay. So at more than one it's the different direction. Okay. Uh, direction. So that actually the first one is this one. And uh, it got like 0.8 second, or it's the same as I, uh, that period I got from FFT. And this is uh, elastic, right? So I ran aspect analysis mm -hmm. and I did eigenvalue analysis after that. Okay. Then I got that. Okay. So uh, you can see also this like lighter like one. So well, one thing to mommy here, because like when we do like a model analysis and when we do like a ground period out of the ground motion analysis, the period changes, right? Like it's not going to be the same. The period of the structure when it's in the ground motion is usually higher than like what you get it mm -hmm. from this one. So that's why I was like asking. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. When it's because of the input ground motion effect and all that. So you have the input effect of the ground motion with the input in it. So I mean. You also said you can't do 
sequential loading in static analysis. What do you mean by that? Oh, so uh, when I did sequential analysis by uh, responsive analysis, I can input, um, I can do the same thing as we did in secure methods, like okay. input in a squeak from the beginning. Okay. But we are doing static analysis, we can do like. You can't replicate the same with sequential. So the damage, uh, we, we can't okay. replicate the damage data that we okay. got from the past three. I was confused if it was a generic statement. No, like you, okay, for, for. for this one. <laughs> okay. For this one. Uh, in one of the slides, you said that you use the sickness monitor for the industry. Oh. Yeah, um, yeah, this one. So you mentioned that you did not use this for the fourth thing for In the sickness monitor. So I. So it's only for the industry that you need to do this? Or? So, in what conditions did you use this? Yeah, yeah okay, effective. Okay, effective in the year. So, you said it's only used in the industry for the problem. Because, uh, because uh, we can say the uh, effective stiffness factor by reducing the. Um, so, one for the tracking? It, we're using the I of the elastic limit mm -hmm. element, but if we are creating the fiber sections, the stiffness of the element is based on whatever material property we use. Okay. So we can't actually so assign the. So if you're using the fiber section, you may not apply any stiffness. Uh, in OpenSea, we cannot apply. <laughs> yeah. You can induce some cracking before loading. That's where you can reduce the stiffness in the fiber section. You can do that. Okay. But because you don't have the physical I value to input there, you cannot do that. But within the fibers, you can make it crack by using concrete O1, where there is no tension capacity. Then when it's loading, it will just crack. Yeah. So that's like cracking. Okay. So you don't have to use any external coefficient. You can't use it in fiber section. <laughs> First question, how did the model the doors? Yeah. Okay. Um, diagram? Or yeah. Diagram? No. So, yeah. So, yeah. Really? Yeah. What did you say? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. So, I, I, use, I, use, I use trust element. Uh, so, uh, I made it really stiff. So, so uh, it's possible to mm -hmm. that. It can behave on rigid diaphragm. But in open state, you can also use like rigid diaphragm. Why you don't use rigid diaphragm? Yeah, so that the uh, multiplication and I. <laughs> 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 yeah, sorry. But um, I, I didn't use that because only because I had a certain cause combining issue. Okay, cool. Thank you. What asking? Uh, about the issue flag. Yeah. 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 Uh, you mentioned that so, so some material model uh, mm -hmm. uh, same model is not always good for all the test results. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder what was the reason for that. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the model. Um, so when I used lump plasticity model, the initial stiffness of the lump plasticity model is um, usually softer than the real initial stiffness. So if we look at the response in small input, it's usually elastic, right? But as the stiffness is softer than real structure, it can cause difference between sediment and analysis. So I mean the, the behavior of the test, the assessment can change, uh, and the model can fix the yeah. 
So if, if we want to really replicate the red elastic response, um, we need to use the light uh, initial stiffness. But if we want to target in elastic response, it's better to use softer and so on. Yeah, it depends on the purpose of the animals. Okay. Uh, in a fiber section this morning. Uh, we can use the same model for like uh, say a DD earthquake and an MC earthquake because we are not changing any thickness or anything, it's all in the fiber space. I mean, we can neglect the tension with the strength of the concrete to assume it is cracking. So, uh, but is there any other properties that we need to change in the model when we change from maybe a DD earthquake and MC earthquake? So if you're using like simple model, you, you need to apply the uh, codes efficient. But if you are using fiber section, the material can represent a more yeah. response. So you don't. Okay. So what the is modeling is crushing, and also mm -hmm. we are not sure that fiber section is being cancelled. So <laughs> it's like it's more complicated than what. Any other questions? Hi, Tomomi. What did you use to plot the mode shapes? Uh, it's at the OpenSea's post processing function. Oh. Like, I, I use plot model to. <laughs> it's. Yeah. Um, they have created new comments. Yeah, so plot model here mm. can show the model. So it's not yeah, it's not more. the best here, but it's good to check your model. Mm. And uh, they also have plot mode. model shape or something. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. So Thanks. you can do this. Any other questions? No. Well, thank you to Mommy for answering. <laughs> thank you guys for attending. We'll send you out a link for the next one. And one second. We, we are planning to do like a workshop for the open system initial for beginner users where we can have like